وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. I'd like to welcome you again, dear viewers, to our program in the names of Allah. And in this episode, we will continue to look at some of the rules which govern how to understand the names of Allah. In the previous episodes, we looked at the sources of the names, what are the authentic sources, what are the inauthentic sources. We also looked at the misuse of the names, how people in the past as well as in the present use Allah's names in the, in the incorrect way, in an incorrect way. You know. Now we're going to continue looking at the rules governing the names of Allah and how to understand them. The first rule that we looked at in our previous session was basically understanding the names of Allah as mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah within the context of the language. The Quran is in Arabic, in pure Arabic. The Sunnah likewise. And we understand the names that are mentioned there according to how they come in Arabic, as they would be understood in the Arabic language, following the same principles found in basically all of the languages. That when people make statements, the norm is to accept those statements according to their face value. We don't go from the norm, the obvious and clear meanings to metaphorical, allegorical, symbolic meanings unless there is either textual evidence or contextual evidence. The term in which it is said, the circumstance in which it is said uh, indicates that this couldn't be what was meant. If I say to somebody uh, you know, I take my hat off to you and I'm not wearing a hat, then the person understands that what is meant by taking off the hat is something metaphorical. It means I respect you, I hold your opinions highly, etc. You know. So that is the general principle that we follow. The second principle that we began to look at Rule number two was basically that all, all of Allah's names are beautiful names, perfect names, which involve, uh, you know, no deficiency. They represent uh, the best and most beautiful w names or understandings that we could have about God. So, any name which uh, doesn't fit in that category, then we don't accept it as a basic principle. And that's why we took the example of Ad-Dahar in the previous uh, session, and we said this was not ap applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because time has a beginning. Ad-Dahar, which means time, it has a beginning. So it isn't one of Allah's names, though it is mentioned in the Sunnah and could be understood to be one of Allah's names. However, uh, we said it was rejected. There are other texts from the Sunnah 
which indicate otherwise. For example, there's a, a, a hadith in Musnad Ahmed in which the Prophet ﷺ had said, Do not curse time, for indeed Allah said, I am time. That's the same. But it goes on to say, The days and nights belong to me. I renew them and let them grow old. And I bring rulers after rulers. So this is clear from the context in which that statement is meant, that said that this didn't mean that Allah is actually time, but that He is in control of time. Now, the second half of Rule 2 is that the attributes of Allah should be treated likewise. That they are attributes of perfection and praise without any elements of deficiency in any respect. Now, if we find an attribute which does have what appears to be a side of deficiency, uh, if it's pure deficiency, then it's definitely not acceptable and applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. For example, death or ignorance or inability, deafness, blindness, any of these kinds of attributes or characteristics which are purely deficient. They are in no way applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are other attributes where if one looks at it from one perspective, it might represent uh, an imperfection. But if one looks at it from another perspective, it is perfection. So where you have an attribute of that type, then what is required is that the perfected aspect of it is what we attribute to, to, attribute to Allah. The imperfections that are in it, that is to His creatures. For example, we have the verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 30, where Allah says, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plot and Allah plots, and Allah is the best of plotters. We also have إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدَ وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدَ Indeed, they scheme and I scheme, like plotting. And we also have in Surah An-Nisa, verse 142, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَادِعُهُمْ Surely the hypocrites try to deceive Allah, but it is He who deceives them. So uh, this concept of plotting, scheming, and deception, these are, with regards to human beings, these are considered to be negative characteristics. Right? So to attribute them, as we understand them with regards to human beings, to Allah, it's not, a, it's not appropriate. However, if we look at it from the perspective of reciprocation, that one who is unable to reciprocate becomes weak. So if they plot and Allah is not able to outplot them, so that would imply weakness with regards to Allah. If they try to deceive Allah and Allah is not able to out-deceive them, then that would imply again weakness with regards to Allah. So in this context where it is a, an issue of, of affirming Allah's ability to outplot them, to deceive them as they try to deceive Him, of course, His is with perfect justification. Theirs is without justification. Their plotting or their scheming or their uh, deception. It is with evil intent. Allah doesn't hold evil intent. So, it, 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 this type of attribute represents a perfection on the part of Allah in that He is able to do what they are doing and beyond. So, that type of attribute we can accept uh, and give it to Allah. But, we don't extract from that attribute a name. So then we're going to call Allah Al-Makir, the plotter, right? Or Al-Qaid, the schemer. Or Al-Khadir, the deceiver. No, these names are not applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has not referred to himself in this way, and it's not acceptable for us to do the same. Especially considering that 
there is that negative element there with it. The other aspect of um, the second rule is that the names, Allah's names, refer to His essence. And they have attributes connected to them. That every name is taken in its fullness. We don't uh, deny the attribute that comes with the name. We don't make names from attributes. That's not permissible. But whenever there is a name, we also have to recognize the attribute because that is what the name implies. The implication of the name has to be uh, recognized also. The third basic rule that we need to consider is where Allah has what we could call affirmative and negative attributes. Affirmative attributes where Allah you know, attributes to Himself uh, attributes like life and knowledge and ability. These are affirmative attributes and we have to affirm them. And at the same time that we affirm them, we have to negate their opposite. Because if Allah refers to Himself as having life, then we cannot associate him with death. Similarly, if he associates with himself knowledge, we don't associate with him ignorance. And if he associates with himself ability, we don't associate with him inability. So those uh, opposites of those affirmative uh, attributes, we have to deny. So if a person says, that this man, Jesus, for example, was God, and he died, as is believed, we say this could not possibly be God. Because God's attribute of life is eternal life, not dying. So where we have a being who dies, then that being cannot possibly die. Be God. Similarly, knowledge and ignorance, where we may find uh, a text which implies that God is unaware of something. For example, in uh, the Bible in the Old Testament, in Genesis, where after Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they hid in the garden. And God is heard walking in the garden and he's calling out. You know, Adam, where are you? Uh, he, he doesn't know where Adam is. That's ignorance. He's not aware. Then we say that attribute is not attributable to Allah. This, this text has to be false. It couldn't possibly be from God. You know. And knowledge, uh, or sorry, ability, the last point, say ability, that God is unable to do something, you know, which is within his being God, uh, any text or any argument which would present that, we would say it has to be false. So, uh, in just closing that point, we're going to take a break now. The point is that whatever Allah has attributed to Himself of the affirmative attributes, positive attributes, then we have to affirm them and at the same time reject their opposites. We'll see you after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong. My name is Shrifi Tuni and this is brought to you from Huda TV. Um, in today's edition, we'll be discussing about uh, the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equated the samawat with darkness, the firmament with darkness, and equated the earth with light. Why? Are there really pillars that cannot be seen? Or is it an unseen oh, oh, pillar? Everything is running, but the relationships are fixed. Yes. So that it would appear to people as if nothing is running, you see. We are destroying the, our environment with our own hands. And that's why the Quran says, الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِي النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمَلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ When you are weak and the road seems long Remember, just remember 
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Welcome back, dear viewers, to our program in the names of Allah. Before the break, we were looking at two aspects of Allah's attributes, what we call the affirmative attributes and the negative attributes. We said as a general rule, the affirmative attributes, where Allah has affirmed something to himself, like life, we have to affirm it in its fullness, in its perfection. And at the same time, we have to negate or reject uh, its opposite. We, we, we don't attribute that opposite to Allah. And this is a very important point, because as we said, there are many people in this world who have accepted gods that die. They have accepted people, animals, beings as God who die. And common sense alone should tell them that this is not reasonable or acceptable to attribute to God. God is one who is eternally living. He doesn't die. So, where death is attributed, we have to say this couldn't be God, without a doubt. On the other hand, where God has denied certain attributes to himself, he has negated them. He says, this is not him. He is not this. For example, we can find in Surah Al-Kahf, where Allah says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدَ And your Lord does not oppress anyone. So Allah denies from himself oppression. He does not oppress. So therefore, we have to, at the same time, uh, negate that from Allah. We affirm the fact that he does not oppress anyone. And at the same time, we also have to affirm its opposite. That is, that Allah is just. Absolutely just. Perfectly just. We have to affirm its opposite. So we don't just deny the fact that Allah does not oppress anyone, we also have to affirm the fact that He is absolutely just. And this is very important, because when it comes to working with the names of Allah, bringing them alive in our lives, this becomes a very important and critical point. If we just take this attribute alone by itself, the issue of oppression, what is it, if we ask ourselves, which drives certain people, a number of people, into disbelief in God? But the idea that God has oppressed them. That what has happened to them in life, some tragedy, some you know, calamity or whatever, they say, what did I do to deserve this? Why did this happen to me? You know, I'm a good person. Why should this happen to me? And because of the fact that they can't accept that this uh, is from a just God, because that's how they perceive it, they can't see any good in it. All they can see is evil. So they say there couldn't be a God there. If there was a God, this wouldn't have happened to me. So this is proof, the fact that this happened to me, this which I consider to be oppression, unfair, then there can't possibly be a God. So that leads them into a state of disbelief. Whereas if one understands that Allah does not oppress anyone, it means that what we perceive as something unfair is in fact fair. Just we can't see how it is. It's in fact, there is good in it. But we're not able to perceive where that good actually is. But if we're clear, if we're clear on this attribute of Allah, that He does not oppress anyone, that He is absolutely just, then that prevents this evil thought from coming over us and drawing us into a state of disbelief where we reject God's existence. 
very, very important point. As I said, this is a very common uh, factor in the disbelief of many people who today deny God. They didn't reason it out. They didn't sit down and logically say, well, look at this, look at that, look at the other. I conclude there isn't a God. No, it's usually an emotional. It's an emotional experience. Something has happened which they can't explain. They don't have an answer for. And it seems to be bad, oppressive, unfair for them. And the only way that they can deal with it by saying, there is no God. Because they can't find an explanation. There couldn't possibly be God. So therefore, I need to blame other people. You know, it's this one's fault or it's that one's fault or whatever. There can't possibly be a God there. So, that was the second aspect of the affirmative and negative attributes of Allah. So, that completes basically our foundation for understanding the names of Allah. Having understood that, we already built, we're now building on, we're already building now on another foundation, which is that all of these names uh, have some relevance in our lives. And we need to now find that relevance. Whether it is simply to praise Allah alone, because we cannot reflect that attribute, or whether it is to not only praise Him, but also to reflect that attribute in our lives, this is the uh, foundation that we are now going to build our understanding of the names of Allah on. So, having understood that, then we can begin to look at the greatest name of Allah. Allah has 99 names. And among those 99 names, one of the names is the greatest. And of course that's greatest relative to human beings. Relative to Allah, it is all the same. What we know is that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on one occasion heard one of his companions make a dua. This dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anni ashhadu annaka anta Allah, la ilaha illa ant, al ahadu samad, alladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. O oh Allah, indeed I beseech you, bearing witness that you are Allah. There is no God worthy of worship besides you, the one, the self-subsisting, who neither gives birth nor is born, and nothing is similar to him. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he heard that, he said, By the one in whose hand lies my soul, he has asked Allah by his greatest name, by which he responds if he is prayed to, and he gives if he is asked with. So from that hadith, and there are other narrations of it, it was concluded that there is one name out of all of Allah's 99 names, or more, which in fact is the greatest of Allah's names. And we did say before, we should just remind viewers, that though we spoke about 99 names, we already gave evidence that the, num the names of Allah are not limited to 99. So, uh, though in this program we are going to just cover 99, we should know that this is really uh, not a limitation, that there are others besides these which we will be covering. Anyway, what we're talking about right now is the greatest name of Allah. What is that greatest name? Well, Scholars differed, there were different opinions, and there are other narrations which mention different verses in the Qur'an where the name can be found, etc., etc. Now, the opinion which a number of the leading scholars agreed upon was that the greatest name of Allah was in fact the name Allah itself. 
And the evidence which is used for that, because of course, um, as I said, there are other different op- there are different opinions. For different reasons, scholars chose other names. Uh, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, he chose the name al Hay because he felt that this was the most basic uh, name of Allah, which represented the most basic attribute, because to be living is you know, the basis for all of the attributes. Without a living God, then all of the attributes have no meaning. So that was his uh, line of argument from, from uh, reason and logic. Anyway, the point is that a number of other scholars, uh, including his own student, Ibn al-Qayyim, held that the greatest name of Allah was in fact Allah. What was the evidence? The first is that that name can be found in all of the hadith narrations which describe the greatest name of Allah, in which it's included, referring to verses here and there. The term Allah is shared by all. The second evidence is that it is the name most mentioned in the Quran itself, over 2,602 times the name Allah is mentioned in the Quran. The nearest name to it, Ar-Rahim, and is, is only 114 times. The next closest to it is Ar-Rahman, 57 times. So we can see very clearly from this that the name Allah is the one most frequently used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And these are among the evidences. There are further evidences for the choice of Allah as the greatest name of Allah. And we will be looking at them in our coming episode. I'd like to thank you all for being with us in this segment of our program, In the Names of Allah. We hope to see you again in our coming programs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. When you are weak and the road seems long, remember, just remember, seek strength from the strong.